This is a story about growing up. Seeking change, we knew our young hearts and dirty fingernails were enough to join the community of spirit. There are some things students can't learn in books. We needed something of our own. We are growing up, and this is where it starts. It's delicious and you know it. It's <laughs> tasty. Why set up a garden at a college, like an on-campus garden? Uh, well, I mean, higher education should be about preparing the next generation. We have, over the last 20 to 50 years, sort of moved higher education increasingly towards specialization and increasingly towards creating experts who are going to go out there and just sort of work for the existing um, job force and the existing industries and the existing economic structure. And if you believe that there's something not quite working well with that structure, um, then you need to use the leverage of, uh, you know, the sort of social reproduction space of a school to create alternatives. Actually learning sustainable farming and sustainable gardening skills, um, learning how to grow the crops themselves, and in a sense, you know, sort of beginning to think about that alternative so when they graduate, they have, they're sort of empowered to say, now I go and create my own sustainable farm. And that's the idea, is that this is the training ground, this is, this is where the next generation is formed. Well, let's provide the kinds of alternatives we think are important going into the future. Previous to the construction and, and growth of this garden, um, there was a sense on campus that we were very much an environmental community, um, but it was, it was factioned and, and it was um, scattered about. So the, the growth and the greenery and the, the, the labor that went into creating this garden um, has kind of organized that community and centralized it. Um, in a way that a lot of things on campus haven't been able to do. It's really hard to start a garden from scratch. Um, there's so many things that go into it, more than just planting seeds. There's so much planning and cooperation between other people, so I've been able to watch it grow from just a few people's plans into an actual producing huge, beautiful, growing thing. Fall semester 2009, last fall semester, is uh, planning, researching, um, interviewing people who worked on other on gardens and farms at other colleges, um, uh, doing a lot of research on farming in Florida, just really building a comprehensive plan and design for essentially a fully functioning farm on campus that could feed um, lots of people. It was an extremely difficult um, project to pass through the administration. Um, so in the winter, um, I believe the, the project got um, downsized and turned over to the students. So it was an extremely, an entirely student-run project. The school told us at the end of last fall semester, like at the very last minute, that they didn't really want to include the garden into their budgeting and their plans until next fall, which would be fall 2010. And the students really, like as student leader, 
I personally didn't feel like that was a good idea. So um, we scaled the whole project down to a pilot project to gauge how successful it would be. And um, I, we started building it this semester. Uh -oh. A lot of like student projects that kind of get started with people who have like all this enthusiasm, but around week two or three, when you realize how much work is involved, you know people tend to lose interest. And luckily, Kip really showed us a mo like a good model as to how to organize ourselves, and he chose really like good people to work on the independent studies set up the garden. So we had like our we knew how much work it was going to take, like, and that this was a, a really big thing we were signing on to. Green, that bed, all those beds. All the first five beds. There's people around campus, especially maybe some faculty and administration, who have this view student undergraduates are kind of, for the most part, incapable of organizing themselves enough to have some, like, an extracurricular project be so successful. I think this is the first project that has really proved that students are capable of doing it. We are capable of working together and being mature enough to, you know, see that all the grunt work is done and all the tedious sort of organizing and delegating and communicating is done to make our project successful. As an environmental studies major at Eckerd, um, I've gone through a lot of theoretical and, and classroom um, studies in terms of how to change things on campus or in your community or in the world um, for the better of, of environmentalism. But we've had very little practical application of, of these things. Honestly, sitting in a classroom all day, you don't really learn much of anything practical. You might have labs, you know, twice a week, if that. But Coming out here, you actually get to see how things work, what works, what doesn't. You actually get to put together projects of your own. Um, it's amazing, you know, like, especially being a part of the physics, everything we do is really on a sheet of paper. The teacher can tell you how something is, but it's maybe not necessarily that way all the time. Um, plus, you know, it's hard just to relate knowledge between one brain and another in any sort of effective way. I think it's a lot better to actually go out and see something happen and see how the world works and just have real life examples for your learning. This baby. In the long run, as far as jobs go, useful experiences we gain from the garden is just working with one another. Um, we pretty much do everything by a group decision, you know. I think one of the best things about having so many different students working at the garden is that we just get to learn from each other. I learn stuff every day I come out here as long as I'm with another student, you know. Um, I learn probably almost as much in this garden as I do in the classroom on a weekly basis. I just can't wait to see how much I know by the time I graduate. And coming to Eckerd, it's, you know, it's a Floridian paradise, but um, I think what I realized when I was down there was that's not really what I was looking for. It's something, you know, uh, I needed something to ground myself. It's pretty amazing being able to be so in tune with a cycle that's inevitably like connected to you, you know, like so much that we have and need comes from plants and being able to kind of help that system go on is really interesting and really important for people to understand how things work. It's really cool watching something grow under your care. is a place where um, people practice their, their ability to um, be creators or 
growing and following the life cycle of, of any type of you know plant, vegetable, flower, herb. Um, but it's that that space where people connect and understand their ability to create. place where you can become <laughs> in contact with um, like your ecosystem and become part of a natural process. They have horns. Yeah, they do. If you surprise them, they go bah! Yeah, they have orange. <laughs> Oh! Look at that! What are you doing? It's orange. Wow! Whoa. Swallowtails eat carrot tops too, so we should be careful of the carrots. They're really beautiful. They look like swallowtail. This guy is like going crazy. This one doesn't have horn action. Wait, yeah, he does. Those are monarchs, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Ooh. swallowtails, like their caterpillars, look like monarchs, so they can trick birds into not eating them, because monarchs are poisonous. Oh, that's really cool. Hmm. Just like that. Just covered up lightly. Yeah. I guess the best way for me to describe what a seed is, it's like the first half of a promise. When a mother plant has or produces a seed, she's basically promising that she'll give the seed everything it needs to start a new life, nutrients, protection, genetic information on how, which direction to grow, but she can't guarantee the conditions that there will, that there will be the proper conditions for the seed to grow. And that's when my part comes in, the actual planting the seed. It's like fulfilling the other half of the promise in which you're promising the plant that you'll give it what it needs to continue a life. Did you see this one? It's beautiful. It's living in many worlds at the same time. <laughs> I've swam and ran up the hill. I've danced and farmed. I stopped to smell the flowers and learn how to beatbox. Playing my flute to the ocean and painting by the river, I can't help but love the darkness and love the sun who gives me heat, life, and sunflowers. Our minds are just ripples on the sea, and our hands are our livelihood. Our heart is actually inside our lips when they open. Dirty, fresh, light. Come on now, light is the same as uh, sunny. No, With different light. kind of light. The opposite of heavy. The opposite of heavy, light. Not like light, no photons. I feel light out here. I think that uh, out here when you're by yourself it's something more on a spiritual level, you know? You're, out here and uh, you 
get to explore the natural world and kind of see what um, the process of how food grows, you know, like, it's kind of amazing. I used to work at Lakewood Elementary School, and there are these kids there, and, you know, they're in elementary school. They don't know a lot about the world yet, but they had no idea that the food that they eat every day is either grown in the ground or, you know, they had no idea the, the path that food took to come to them and how can you make responsible decisions about the way you eat and um, your impact on the world unless you kind of know the processes that um, are behind everyday life, you know? Provides that kind of healing process where people can learn and experience where their food comes from and how difficult it is actually to grow that food. So the appreciation comes um, in a lot stronger form. How do worms help compost? The uh, worms, they eat the uh, vegetable wastes um, and they make break down much faster than microorganisms would ever, uh, would ever do that. Um, they won't eat any vegetable waste right away. It has to start decomposing on its own before the worms will eat it. Um, because they don't have teeth, they can't chew it. Oh. So once a fungus or a bacterium starts breaking down the vegetable wastes, the worms will eat it and finish the process much faster. Where are the worms going to go at the end of the semester? I am taking them home. <laughs> I'm going to put them in my basement and hope my mom doesn't find out. <laughs> um, a lot of the organisms can go dormant in drought situations. They just stop producing any compost. Mm. And then other types of rotting start happening which do smell bad. So you got to make sure it's damp but not soaked. If you soak it you get an op another problem which also smells bad and that's that there's no oxygen in the compost. So there needs to be air inside the compost. <laughs> that's a uh, hipper cup that hasn't quite decomposed yet. This soil looks really great, man. Especially if you go a little bit deeper, it gets so dark. And it's still very... You can actually feel how hot it is down there, too. Where stuff mm. is still decomposing. So. This. Which is pretty much concentrated plant food. Mmm, and it smells good, too. It's a little sweet. When do you know when to move? That here. When it gets so big that it's no longer really manageable, so when it gets hard to turn, oh. it becomes time to move it over. If you put anything in the compost, it better go right there. Otherwise, you're in big trouble. So I better go and write down what we put in. Catfish shut all this up. He's really serious about compost. Gardening is where the universe and the soul sort of meet each other. It's where we bring nature inside of ourselves and make ourselves. And so it's probably the most critical relationship that we have. And most of us don't do it, yet all of us eat. Um, and so from the perspective of environmental studies, where we're looking for ways to help heal the relationship with nature that seems to have gotten out of whack in the modern world, um, this is a sort of a perfect place because you're doing something that's profoundly meaningful. You're producing food that nourishes and sustains, um, but at the same time you have to really deal with the vagaries of nature. So I'm using neem oil on these squash because I'm very worried about them. It seems like a fungus has gotten to them and so we need to use some antifungal agent to uh, try and fight. And apparently neem oil is pretty good. I'm trying it out. It smells really weird, but uh, it's all natural and stuff. That's good. We got some other options to use if this doesn't seem to be doing anything. Hi, Mom. Milk and tea tree oil, but whatever. Just to add some natural or like you know eco-friendly dish detergent to emulsify it in the water, which kind of weirds me out, but we're doing it anyway. I think food production and thinking about reflecting on and working on food production is one of the most important things we could turn to at this juncture to help us get reconnected um, and reconnected both with the earth and with the community that we're growing this food. Good. 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 Good.
No, not for the camera, for you. Surprisingly tasty. That is delicious. Very tasty. Quite tasty. One of the tastiest collards I've ever tasted. Yeah. One of the tastiest collards he's ever time. tasted. Yeah. One of the tastiest, yeah. man. Definitely. And you've had some tasty collards. I've had many tasty collards. You're a collard connoisseur, so I'm I am. I am a collard connoisseur. And that is one tasty collard. I get collard fishing out of it. Yeah. We got to go to College Fest next week. Oh, College Fest is going to be tight. Where is that? Sacramento? Oh, it's probably more in the south. I don't know, man. What do you have to say about the garden? Let it flow. Well, it made me a little sad because when we went, the things had died. But they also looked really cool, so that made me happy. So I'd have to say I feel pretty neutral about the whole shenanigans of the garden. But let me tell you something, those carrots are delicious. He told me that women are better welders because it's like very delicate work. Are they good? Hell yeah! What's this guy? What's he doing? He reseated himself. Huh? He reseated himself. Did he? Mm-hmm. Why over here? Because there were peppers here last year. Uh, what's that? Is that a weed? Yeah, that's a weed. That's not Swiss chard. That ain't no Swiss chard. Why is it your favorite? Because the proportions are just right. That's right. That's a cute vegetable. And I'm a man. <laughs> I'm assuming. I really love to pick the peppers. Because when you pick them, it goes like this. And you get to hear, with, with every pepper you pick, you hear this sound of absolute satisfaction that goes And with every, there's another pepper. And with every pepper, there's a better world. I think three is a better number for a bundle. Don't you? A three. Okay, three. It's a bouquet. Three is the lucky number. Three is the most stable number. Yeah. Oh. We're tying these veggies here into small bundles so that we can display them on our table tomorrow at the Festival of Hope. And any onlookers or students who are participating or passing by in the Festival of Hope will be able to stop at our table and grab some free produce, fresh local organic produce. How local? As local as it gets, my friend. Alright, I'm telling you more. Oh yeah, I'm telling you buddy, it's right here on campus. On campus? Oh yeah. young environmentalists have worked with like other students there's this feeling that like oh we're, we're too late 
there's nothing we can do. We feel powerless in the face of these issues. But you know, there's there is there's you know, where's this timeline we're on where we've reached the end? Right, you know, exactly. That's I don't you know, I, I wanna do something now. It's just saying, you know, I'm going to do this myself because I'd rather not have chickens that were pumped full of hormones and I'd rather not have vegetables that were sprayed with pesticides and I'd rather not be eating genetically modified foods that are based off of unsound science and so these are things that are going on pretty regularly in the conventional food industry and organic vegetables can cost a lot and organic chicken costs more and so Doing it yourself is one way to opt out and just avoid all those things that may or may not be morally justified in your mind. When you're in the grocery store, you have no idea who picked the produce that you're consuming or what conditions they were working under. And when you garden, you know. I mean, I think sensitive people realize they're missing something in their humanity. You know, have students who are sort of interested in thinking about organics, you know, thinking about the natural world, actually learning sustainable farming and sustainable gardening skills. And in a sense, you know, sort of beginning to think about that alternative so when they graduate, they have, they're sort of empowered to say, now I go and create my own sustainable farm. And, you know, we already have graduates who are starting to do that. Um, you know, I think of, of Dylan. Um, who went through a number of my different classes and now is trying to start a sustainable urban farm in Durham, North Carolina. We have taken this um, 1940s farmhouse that was traditionally a sharecropper's house um, it's on the back side of 96 acres of retired no. tobacco I land. The house when we got it was pretty much in shambles, it, but we saw potential in it and uh, there's a lot that three strong-willed people can do with a little bit of time and some recycled materials. And our, our goal, our overall goal is to um, <clears throat> build a model home that is made primarily with recycled materials um, in a design that maximizes our um, sustainable independence. So we have started a large mm, quarter acre garden plot. We're uh, working towards food independence. We're um, working towards energy independence um, based off of passive solar designs, rainwater collection and uh, filtration. We use a wood stove at the moment for heat and it all takes a lot of hard work which is something that um, once again comes from an ex a background in you know you work hard, you live hard and you feel good about what you've done. Definitely using the skills that I learned during the creation of that garden, the other skills that, that I'm using now are the people management skills, the just general meeting skills, because I think that's one of the, the greatest successes of that garden was open meetings that, you know, ideas bounce around and um, things become concrete. Uh, those are the type of skills I'm using now, living in a, in a, a multiple person's habitat. It's an, an effort in joint growth and joint learning and in, in um, the ability to provide for yourself and uh, and not rely on much else. So that's what we're attempting to do, grow and build.
is that my friends and I are capable of creating a space where social change grows through establishing an alternative culture. We are capable of doing it, and I know that we will continue doing it after graduation. The establishment of this garden has been the roots of the change we hope to make in the world. And this is only the beginning of our story. The rest is yet to come.